I've always been the odd one out in my family, the black sheep, as they say. My name's Cheryl James, and I'm 32 now, but for as long as I can remember, I've never really fit in. I grew up as the oldest child of two doctors, Isabella and Adam James. My parents were big shots, but none of that good stuff ever really came my way. All the attention and perks were reserved for my younger twin brothers, Scott and Charles. The moment those two were born, it was like I became invisible to my parents. At first, it was little things like them getting a bigger slice of cake or newer toys, but as we got older, it became worse and more obvious. I'll never forget my 12th birthday. I had been hinting for ages about this art set I saw in a shop window, not anything fancy, just a simple kit with some decent paints and brushes. When my birthday finally came, I was so excited to open my one present. But what did I find? A math workbook. By the time I hit my teenage years, the favoritism was right in my face. Family trips were always based on what the boys wanted. If Scott wanted to go skiing, we'd be off to the slopes. If Charles got into surfing, it was straight to the beach. My ideas were always dismissed or ignored. Then came the whole college application process, still a sore subject. At 18, I fell in love with art restoration. I spent hours at the local museum, asking the staff a million questions about how they repaired old artwork. When I mentioned studying art restoration in college, my mom acted like I had said I wanted to run away and join the circus. Art restoration, she laughed. Cheryl, be serious, that's not a real job. Scott even chimed in with a smug grin, yeah, Cheryl, why don't you do something useful, like becoming a doctor? The look of pride on my parents' faces when Scott said that. I'd never seen them look at me like that. Even though my family wasn't on my side, I was determined to follow my passion. When college acceptance letters started arriving, I was thrilled to see that I had been awarded a scholarship for art restoration. I ran into the kitchen, waving the letter around, practically shouting, Mom! Dad! I got a scholarship! My mom barely glanced up from her medical journal. That's nice, honey, she said, did you hear the boys got perfect scores on their SATs? The day I left for college felt worlds apart from the day the twins left three years later. I packed up my old laptop and thrift store clothes, getting ready to catch the bus to my not-so-fancy state school. My parents were too busy with their work to even give me a ride to the bus station. But there was one person who always saw me for who I was, my grandma Julie. She showed up that day, and just before I was about to leave, she pulled me aside. Cheryl, sweetie, she said, slipping a small envelope into my hand. I'm so proud of you. Don't ever forget that. Inside the envelope was a check. It wasn't enough to change my whole life, but it was enough to make things a little easier. But more than the money, what really mattered was that she noticed me. That meant everything. College was a bit of a mixed experience for me. On one hand, I was finally free from always being compared to Scott and Charles. I could focus on my studies without feeling like I had to compete for attention. But on the other hand, money was tight, really tight. I was barely managing on my scholarship and part-time jobs. Meanwhile, I'd hear about all the fun things my brothers were doing through family calls and social media, fancy frat parties, spring break trips to exotic places, internships at big hospitals, all paid for by our parents, of course. As time passed, I threw myself into my studies. Art restoration became more than just a job I wanted, it became my escape, my happy place. There was something so satisfying about bringing beauty back to old, forgotten pieces, about revealing the hidden potential under layers of dirt and damage. In my final year, I landed an internship at a small but respected museum. The work wasn't glamorous, it was mostly cleaning and organizing, but it was a step in the door, and I was thrilled. When I called home to share the good news, my mom's response was exactly what I expected, barely interested. Oh, that's nice, dear, she said, sounding distracted. Did you hear about Scott's research paper? It's going to be published in a major medical journal. I held back a sigh. That's great, mom. Listen, I was thinking of coming home for the weekend soon, maybe we could. Oh, I'm not sure that's a good idea, she cut me off quickly. 
Your father and I will be really busy. We're helping the boys with their research papers. You understand, right? As I hung up the phone, that familiar mix of anger and hurt started building in my chest again. But this time, there was something different, a small spark of defiance, of determination. I looked around my small dorm room, art books stacked on my desk, and a half-finished restoration project taking up most of the floor. This was my world now, a world I had built on my own, despite everything. Forget them, I muttered to the empty room. I don't need their approval. But even as I said it, deep down, I knew it wasn't true. A small part of me still wanted my parents to notice me, still hoped that one day they would see who I really was. Graduation came and went without much attention from my family. My big day was celebrated with a quick dinner at a chain restaurant. So, Cheryl, what's next? Dad asked, barely looking up from his menu. I straightened up and tried to sound confident. I actually got a job offer from a museum in Los Angeles. Dad frowned. I don't know, Cheryl. Los Angeles is expensive. How much does this job pay? I felt my face get hot as I mumbled the not-so-great starting salary. The disappointment on their faces was hard to miss. The rest of the dinner was a blur of subtle criticism and more comparisons to Scott and Charles's academic success. As we were leaving the restaurant, Grandma Julie pulled me aside. Don't let them dim your light, my dear, she whispered, slipping another small envelope into my hand. Go to Los Angeles and chase your dreams. Inside the envelope was a check, just enough to cover my first month's rent in the city. I hugged her tightly, trying not to cry. The next few years were a whirlwind. I threw myself into my work, slowly making a name for myself in the art restoration world. During this time, I met John. He was a struggling graphic designer with a kind smile and an infectious passion for his work. We clicked instantly over our shared love of art and our experiences as underdogs in our fields. After dating for a while, I decided it was time for John to meet my family. From the moment we sat down, it was clear my parents had other plans. They fired question after question at John, each one more intense than the last. So, John, Dad began, trying to sound casual but failing, what are your long-term career prospects? John shifted in his seat, clearly uncomfortable. Well, I'm building up my client base. It takes time, but I'm making progress. Mom jumped in, and your income? Is it enough to support a family? My face flushed with embarrassment. Mom, that's not, but John squeezed my hand under the table. It's okay, Cheryl, he said calmly. I'm not where I want to be financially yet, Dr. James, but I'm working hard to get there. The interrogation continued throughout dinner, and with each question, it was clear my parents weren't convinced. I could see John's confidence dropping and my own anger rising. As we were leaving, Mom pulled me aside. Cheryl, honey, I know you think you care about this boy, but you need to be realistic. You've already picked a tough career path. Don't make it harder by being with someone who has no future. Mom, I whispered, shocked at how blunt she was. Dad stepped in too. Your mother's right, Cheryl. You need to think about your future. John seems nice, but is he really good enough for you? You could do so much better. I stood there speechless, as all the frustration I had bottled up for years nearly boiled over. How dare they judge John? How dare they dismiss my choices once again? As John and I started planning our wedding, reality hit us hard. Our savings were pretty small, barely enough for a simple ceremony. One night, after staring at budget spreadsheets for hours, I decided to ask my parents for help. Maybe they'd want to contribute. Mom, Dad, I began cautiously during our weekly call, John and I have set a date for the wedding. We're trying to keep costs low, but I was wondering if you might want to help out a little, maybe even just with the planning? The silence on the other end was long and uncomfortable. Finally, Mom spoke, her voice cold. Cheryl, you're an adult now. If you've chosen to marry this person, you need to handle the consequences yourself. I hung up feeling awful, but not really surprised. 
Once again, Grandma Julie stepped in to save the day. When I told her about the situation, she didn't hesitate. My dear, she said warmly over the phone, I may not be able to give you the wedding of your dreams, but I want to help make your day special. She sent some money, and while it wasn't much, it made a big difference in our plans. The wedding day came, and I had a mix of excitement and nerves. The community center we rented was simple, but it looked lovely, decorated with wildflowers and fairy lights. Our close friends helped with everything, from the decorations to the homemade cake. As I walked down the makeshift aisle, John's face lit up with a smile that made all the struggles worth it. For a moment, I forgot about the money issues and my family's negativity and just soaked in the love in his eyes. That bubble burst when I saw my family. Mom and Dad sat stiffly in the front row, looking bored and unimpressed. I overheard Mom whispering to Dad about how tacky the decorations were and how cheap the food seemed. Scott and Charles were even worse, standing in the corner, laughing and glued to their phones. I tried my best to ignore them, focusing on our vows and the kind, supportive faces of our friends. It wasn't until the next day that I realized how truly cruel they could be. When I woke up, my phone was blowing up with notifications. Scott and Charles had posted a bunch of embarrassing photos from the wedding on social media. Congrats to our big sis on her special day, read one caption under a blurry picture of John and me cutting our homemade cake. Another post had a sarcastic caption, nothing says true love like a dollar store wedding, next to a picture of our decorations. One post showed our buffet table beside a photo of a fancy meal from a high-end restaurant with the caption, Cheryl's wedding versus our average Thursday lunch, guests, which is which. The comments were brutal. Some relatives were horrified by Scott and Charles's behavior, Aunt Nicole wrote, this is completely unacceptable. You should be ashamed of yourselves. But others found it funny. Our cousin Mark commented, savage but true. That wedding looked like a homeless convention. Reading through the comments made me feel sick. But what hurt the most was seeing my parents' responses. Instead of scolding their sons, they were encouraging them. Mom had commented, boys will be boys. It's just a bit of harmless fun. I didn't call them or demand an apology. I just decided to cut them out of my life for a while. Five months after the wedding, it was time for the annual James family reunion. Even though I had my doubts, John thought we should go, hoping it might be a chance to clear the air. We couldn't have been more wrong. The tension was so thick you could feel it. I kept it together for the first hour making polite conversation and avoiding my immediate family as much as possible. But then, I overheard Scott bragging about his latest luxury vacation, paid for by our parents, of course. Something inside me snapped. Must be nice, I said loud enough for everyone to hear, to have mom and dad pay for your entire life. The room went silent. Scott stared at me, speechless. What's that supposed to mean, he finally asked. You know exactly what it means, I replied, all the frustration I had buried for years boiling over. You and Charles get everything handed to you on a silver platter, while I've had to fight for every bit of recognition or support. Mom stepped forward, her face red with anger. Now Cheryl, you're being ridiculous. We've always treated you kids equally. I let out a bitter laugh. Equal? Are you serious? Let's talk about equal. I started counting on my fingers. Private school tuition for the boys, public school for me. Brand new cars for their 17th birthdays, nothing for mine. And the grand finale, $700,000 for their Ivy League educations while I had to scrape by on scholarships and loans. The room was so silent you could hear a pin drop. Everyone was staring, watching our family's dirty laundry being aired out in front of them. Mom's voice was cold when she finally spoke. If you're so obsessed with money, Cheryl, maybe you should have married someone rich instead of your poor husband. Her words hit me like a slap. John, who had been quietly supporting me the whole time, stiffened beside me. How dare you, I whispered, feeling tears in my eyes. John is worth ten of you. He loves me for who I am, not for how I can make him look to his country club friends. The reunion spiraled into chaos. 
Everyone started yelling, dragging up old grudges, years of anger spilling out in the middle of it all. A strong voice rose above the noise. Enough! Everyone turned to see Grandma Julie standing up. Her normally kind face looked stern and angry. I've watched this family fall apart for years, and I won't stand for it anymore, she said firmly. Isabella, Adam, your treatment of Cheryl has been shameful. And you boys, she added, turning to Scott and Charles, your cruelty toward your sister is unforgivable. The room went silent again, but Mom, never one to back down, spat out, Mother, you don't understand. Cheryl has always been difficult, always causing problems. No, Isabella, Grandma interrupted. The only problem here is your obvious favoritism and your refusal to see the damage you've done. I looked around at the shocked faces of my relatives, at Grandma standing tall, and at my parents' anger and my brother's smug expressions. In that moment, something inside me broke, but then, it came back together, stronger. I'm done, I said quietly, but firmly. I'm done trying to get your approval. Done being part of this toxic family. John and I are leaving, and don't bother trying to contact us. The months that followed were tough, but John was my rock through it all. He held me when the sadness hit, celebrated the little victories, and never once made me feel bad for the family drama I had brought into our lives. Life has a strange way of surprising you when you least expect it. It all started with a phone call. John had been working tirelessly for weeks, pouring everything he had into a pitch for a major client. The call came on a sunny Thursday morning. I could tell from the look on John's face that something big had just happened. We got it, he whispered, barely able to speak. Cheryl, we got the contract. The next few months were a whirlwind. John's small design firm blew up overnight, and that big client opened doors we never thought we'd see. Suddenly, we weren't just getting by anymore, we were doing really well. But with all that success came an unexpected problem. My phone started lighting up with notifications. Friend requests from family members I had blocked long ago. Messages from distant relatives who suddenly wanted to catch up. And then, the call I had been dreading. Cheryl, sweetheart, my mom's sugary sweet voice came through the line. We heard the wonderful news about John's business. We always knew you two would make it. The calls kept coming. My father chimed in, saying how proud they were and how they'd always believed in us. I sat there, stunned and getting angrier with every lie. We'd love to see you, Mom chirped. Maybe we could have dinner and celebrate your success, as a family. That snapped me out of it. As a family? I repeated, my voice hard. We haven't been a family for a long time, and that's not going to change just because our bank account has. I stuck to my decision. When my parents showed up at our door unexpectedly, I didn't let them in. When they sent expensive gifts, I sent them back unopened. Instead, John and I focused on building the life we had always dreamed of. We worked hard, saved wisely, and soon enough, we were signing papers for a beautiful apartment right in the middle of the city. Excited to share our happiness, I posted a photo on social media. It was a simple shot, John and I holding the keys, standing in front of our new home. Next to it was a picture from our most recent visit with Grandma Julie, her proud smile shining for the camera. I captioned it, New Beginnings and Old Love. Grateful for those who've been there through it all. As I hit post, I felt a weight lift off my shoulders. This was my family now, John, Grandma Julie, and the friends who had stuck with us through thick and thin. We had built this life ourselves, despite all the challenges and despite the people who said we couldn't do it. The soft evening light poured through the windows of our new apartment as I worked in the kitchen, getting dinner ready for John and Grandma Julie. It was our first real family dinner in the new place, and I wanted everything to be perfect. Suddenly, there was a loud, aggressive pounding on the front door that shattered the peace. Cheryl, open up. We know you're in there. My blood ran cold. I recognized those voices anywhere, Scott and Charles. Before I could react, the door burst open, and my brothers stormed in, their faces twisted with anger. 
I barely had time to see John jump to his feet before Scott was in my face, jabbing his finger at my chest. You manipulative little, he snarled. We always knew you were playing a long game, but this? This is low, even for you. I stumbled back, shocked by the venom in his voice. What are you talking about? I asked. Charles laughed, a harsh, mean sound. Don't play dumb, Cheryl. We saw your little social media post, showing off your new apartment, posing with grandma. You think we can't figure it out? It hit me what they were accusing me of. You think grandma bought us this apartment? We know she did, Scott spat. You've been playing the poor, neglected child for years, worming your way into her good graces. Now, you've tricked her into making you the sole heir. Anger surged through me, and I stood taller. You have no idea what you're talking about. John and I bought this apartment with our own money, money we worked hard for. Charles sneered, his eyes darting around the room. Right, sure you did. Where's the old bat anyway? Hiding her so we can't talk some sense into her? She should be in a cemetery by now. I can't wait for her to kick the bucket so I can sell her house and live it up. The room went deadly silent. For a second, I thought I had imagined those awful words. Then, a quiet voice came from the doorway of the guest room. So, this is how you really feel about me? All heads turned to see Grandma Julie standing there, her face a mix of shock and disappointment. The color drained from Scott and Charles's faces as they realized she had heard everything. Grandma! Scott stammered, we didn't mean, Julie raised her hand, stopping him. I've heard enough, she said, her voice calm but firm. Now I understand who truly values me and who sees me as just a meal ticket. Her words gave me the strength to speak. I think you both need to leave now. For a moment, it looked like they might argue, but one look at Grandma's hurt, yet resolute, face made them back down. They slunk toward the door, muttering weak excuses. The aftermath of that evening hit like a storm. My phone wouldn't stop buzzing, filled with calls and messages. Each one reminded me of the mess that had blown up. Mom's name flashed on the screen for what felt like the hundredth time, and against my better judgment, I considered answering. I picked up the call. Cheryl, Mom's voice was sharp, not sounding like a mother at all, you need to fix this. Your grandmother is furious with the boys. You need to smooth things over and tell her it was all a misunderstanding. I let out a bitter laugh. A misunderstanding? They broke into my home and said they couldn't wait for her to die so they could sell her house. How is that a misunderstanding? They didn't mean it, Dad jumped in, clearly on speakerphone. You know how the boys can be, they were just upset. Upset about what? I challenged. That John and I bought an apartment with our own money? That Grandma loves me? Mom's voice turned sweet but fake. Sweetheart, we know you've always felt left out, but you need to think about what's best for the family. Your brothers deserve that inheritance, don't be selfish. Something inside me snapped. Years of frustration and pain boiled over. Selfish? You're calling me selfish? After years of favoritism, ignoring my achievements, and treating John and me like we don't matter, now you have the nerve to ask me to give up an inheritance I never even asked for? Cheryl, now hold on, Dad began, but I cut him off. No. I'm done. I'm done with the guilt trips, the manipulation, all of it. Don't call me, don't text me, and don't come to my door. We're through. Over the next few days, I blocked their numbers, along with Scott and Charles's. It was painful, like cutting off something rotten, but it was necessary for my healing to begin. As the dust settled, I found myself surrounded by a different kind of warmth. Grandma Julie, now fully aware of the family dynamics she had long suspected, became an even bigger part of our lives. Aunt Nicole, who had reached out after the wedding mess, became a regular visitor. I always knew you were special, Cheryl, she said, hugging me tightly. I'm sorry I didn't stand up for you sooner. 
Other relatives, cousins, distant aunts, and uncles, who had seen how my family mistreated me over the years, sent messages of support. It felt like a veil had been lifted, allowing real relationships to grow where before there had only been obligation. John's family, bless them, surrounded me with unconditional love. His parents, who had watched from the sidelines as my own family tore me down, went out of their way to make me feel cherished. John and I poured ourselves into making our new apartment a home. Every piece of furniture, every photo on the wall was a symbol of the life we were building together, a life built on mutual respect, support, and love.